Well, after a five-week sabbatical, I'd like to get back to the Satan series that I started oh, a few months ago, I guess now. I think this is part number nine. And we've made it through the origin of Satan and then the fall of Satan. We looked at his attributes. We looked at his names and titles. We looked at his tactics. We looked at how to resist him. And now I want to get into what I've called the epic war, the great long war uh, between Satan and God and his people. And I chose the name Epic because there was another series that you know that uh, Elder Conrad did called The Ever War, and I didn't want to use the exact same term. And this is going to be a a similar idea anyway. It's going to be my take on things, and it's going to be somewhat different. But we're going to look at the Great War, the war that started from really from the very beginning, right at the end of the first week of creation, whenever Satan rebelled, going the whole way down through history to the whole way to the end of time. And it's quite interesting, as you look at the Bible with this in mind, then you start to see all kinds of things that you didn't really notice before. And when you look at the various different Bible stories and events, and when you think about it with it in mind that it is a battle between Satan and God, and Satan trying to prevent the Messiah from coming, and Satan trying to destroy God's people, then it's it's really interesting. And I think that you're going to I hope that you're going to get some benefit out of this and enjoy it. I know it was enjoyable to me to put it together. And I was looking up the definition of epic just to make sure I was using a correct word. And I don't have it written down, but basically my my definition of it would be just a concise version. It's just a long story. Like it's it's a narrative. And you read about the epics in poetry back, you know, going back thousands of years. And it also carries with it the sense of something that is great and large, right? So I think it's a pretty good term to describe it. So the, the battle began, the first war began in heaven itself. And I talked about this in the second sermon on Satan's fall. And I'm not going to recount all that information. But what I will do is just give you just a brief overview of how the war began. And we know that God created Lucifer. He was the chief of the angels. And God created him during the creation week. And if you remember, we deduced that, or I, I don't know why I say we, but I deduced and you listened. So I guess I could say we deduced, but... Anyway, I always feel like I have a mouse sitting on my shoulder or something when I'm talking about we preached and this and that because you didn't really preach it. I preached it and you, you listened to it. But anyway, that being said, so Satan was created the, in the creation week and the way that we know that he was created on day one as I taught before many, many weeks ago is that um, the angels witnessed the creation, the, the laying of the foundation of the earth And if the angels watched the foundation of the earth being laid, then that tells us that the angels were around whenever the foundation of the earth was laid. And we know that the foundation of the earth was laid on day one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So we know, therefore, that Satan and the angels, he was called Lucifer back then, must have been created on day one as the first thing of God's creation before he even created the earth since they watched it. And you can read about that in Job chapter 38, that the sons of God uh, saw when they saw the, the foundations of the earth being laid that they sang for joy, we're told. Now, after the sixth day of creation, Lucifer became proud, and he decided that he wanted to be like the Most High. We talked about that in when I talked about the fall of Satan, and that's recorded in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. This was Lucifer's downfall, wanting to be like the Most High. I know that this had to have happened after the sixth day of creation because at the end of the sixth day of creation, God said everything was very good. So if Lucifer had already fallen, that is not very good, right? So we know that it had to be after the sixth day of creation that Lucifer even had an inkling and started to plot and plan and scheme about um, this great war because that would not be very good. So it happened at least after the sixth day and the rebellion itself must have happened at least after the seventh day because God rested on the seventh day. And I don't know about you, but you know, fighting a war in heaven against 50 million angels would not be really a day of rest to me. So we'd have to say that the, the war happened at least after the seventh day. And it could have happened you know, days, weeks, months, even years after that, I suppose. I don't know how long uh, that went. Then Lucifer led a third of the angels in this rebellion against God, and he was defeated and then cast out of heaven. And this, this happened at that time there, shortly after the creation. And I proved all that stuff back there in uh, section three of this outline. So you can take a look at that if you don't remember. That was a few months ago. 
Now we get down to the next battle. So that was the, the one, that was the big rebellion, the big battle, and a third of the angels are cast out of heaven, and that's at least, um, you know, that's millions and millions of angels because we read in Revelation that there are, um, what was it, 10,000 times 10,000 or something, which is uh, 100 million. So we know that there are uh, millions of God, 100 million of God's angels, and if a third of the angels were cast out, then that means if there's 100 million of God's angels, that means that there's at least 50 million of Lucifer's angels. That would add up to 150 million, right? So if you got, I'm getting some blank looks. So if you got, if you got 150 million, let's take it from the 150 million, and a third of them were cast out, that's 50 million, right? That leaves 100 million of God's angels. So anyway, uh, that was that was a big war. Now we make it our make our way down to the Garden of Eden. Now this happens sometime after day seven, and I don't know exactly when this happened, but we know it's after day seven anyway. And now we have the next battle, and this battle is focused. Um, on bringing down man. So Satan wants to bring down man. He was not able to bring down God from his throne. So now he's going to go for the next best thing, and he's going to try to bring down man. And it is clear, and, and I'm going to get into why this was so important to Satan to bring down man. Because it was clear that the focus of God's creation was man. And we can, just, we can, get, we can deduce this just by some things that are said here in the creation account. If you look in... Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 27. We read here that God saved man for the last thing in his creation. You have the old saying, save the best for last. Well, this is what God did in his creation. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let us have dominion over the fish of the sea. Or no, I'm sorry, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So clearly here, man is, is in dominion. Man is uh, the, the steward of the creation. So man is the greatest thing that God has created on this earth and they have dominion over everything. And they're made in God's very image, which certainly can't be said of any of the animals. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. I'm not going to dwell on this, but it's interesting. Here you have, in these two verses, the the fact that God is plural, that God is a trinity, three in one, and that he's also singular, that he is one God. Because it says there, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Right. So there's a plurality in the Godhead. And then in 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. So you have God being plural and singular at the same time. So you don't even get through the first chapter of the Bible before you have the doctrine of the Trinity revealed to you. This is not some New Testament apostolic creation. This goes back to the very beginning. Then God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and he made him a living soul. If you look in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. This was not said of any of the animals. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So if you think about it, if you are Lucifer and you're watching the creation, and you see God create all these really interesting animals. And some of them are huge, some of them are tiny, and some of them have amazing capabilities. But then man is created, and God says specifically that he created them in his own image. And then he breathes into him the breath of life and he makes him a living soul. And you can just imagine Lucifer seeing this and saying, huh, something special about that, right? This, is, this creation of man is quite different than the rest of the animal creation. God created Eve out of Adam. And this was unique among the creation. With the rest of the animals, God created them. It just says he created the, the, the animals and then they were to produce after their kind. So obviously he created male and female together at the same time. But with man, he created Adam first, and then out of Adam, he created Eve, which is another thing that makes man's creation unique. Genesis chapter 2, 21 through 22. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took out one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof instead. You see, the technology of surgery and anesthesia goes back a long ways. That's exactly what God did. He put him to sleep, Mate used anesthesia on him and took out a rib and closed up the flesh. So he cut him open, he took out the rib, he sewed him back up, 
So I guess the practice of surgery is uh, certainly a biblical one. Verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And then God gave Adam and Eve dominion over all the creation, which we read about there in Genesis 1 and verse 26. So none of the rest of the creation this could be said of. So let's just go back to Satan now. So Satan had two great faults. His two faults were pride and envy. And I'll show you this from the scripture, and then we'll kind of see how the two of these things go hand in hand. So if you look in Isaiah 14... 13 through 14. So I want to go back to Satan for a second, and I want to lay some groundwork to see why Satan would then go after the man. Isaiah 14, verses 13 through 14. Isaiah 14, 13 through 14. This is speaking of Lucifer before he fell. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the, congr- uh, upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That is a proud statement if I've ever heard one. And then we read in Ezekiel 28 and verse 17 of Lucifer's pride. Ezekiel 28 and verse 17 he said, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast, corrupt, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that, thou may, that they may behold thee. It says, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. That is a synonym of pride, right? If your heart is lifted up, you have a high opinion of yourself. And that's exactly what pride is. Pride is defined as a high or overweening opinion of one's own qualities, attainments, or estate, which gives rise to a feeling and attitude of superiority over and contempt for others, inordinate self-esteem. His heart was lifted up. He's full of pride, in other words. Now, pride and envy go hand in hand because, uh, well, I'll show you here. In in James chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. James chapter 4, 5 through 6. If you have a high opinion of yourself, then when you see somebody else that has something better than you, of course you're going to envy that person because you want to be the best. So pride and envy clearly go together. And James shows us this in James chapter 4, 5 through 6. He says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. I wanted, I started in four, I'm sorry. Verse five. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace? Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You see, he goes right from the spirit of us that dwells in us lusteth to envy to God resisting the proud and giving grace to the humble. The spirit of envy and the spirit of pride our bedfellows, they go together like a hand in a glove. Now, the thing about pride is that it's a source of strife. It is, uh, it is a guarantee that if there is strife, there's pride behind it somewhere. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10. So we're going to start to see why Satan would have started this war with God. Why the strife? Well, the strife was a result of the pride. And just think about it. So you, here you have Satan. He's the, the, the pinnacle, uh, the, the most wise of God's creation, uh, the most beautiful of God's creation. And now God creates man. And Satan's been around for a week or so, and he can bask in his own glory. And now all of a sudden man gets created, and God breathes into him the breath of life, and he makes him a living soul. And he gives man dominion over all the creation. And this is before Satan fell. Think about that. So Satan tries to attack God, first of all, and fails Where is he going to go next? To the height of the creation, to man. He's envious of man because of his pride. Proverbs 13 and verse 10. Proverbs 13 and verse 10. This is what you call reasoning from the scripture. Because though it doesn't straight up say that, we can conclude that by looking at all the things that are said of Satan. 
Proverbs 13 and verse 10. It says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. So, according to this proverb, and by the use of that word only, if you have contention, pride is the source of it. There may be other things that contribute to it, but guess what? What is it the fount of it? Pride. If there's contention in a church, there are proud members in the church. If there's contention in a marriage, there are proud members in the marriage. At work, at school, wherever, anywhere you go, you're going to find pride the source of strife. Look at Proverbs 28 and verse 25. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Well, Satan was proud and he stirred up strife. This proverb is true of him just like it is of all of us. Now, envy is one of the most injurious of all sins. We're told something curious here in Proverbs chapter 27. Just turn back a page. Proverbs 27 and verse 4 says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? It's, it's tough to deal with it with an angry man or with a cruel man. Those would not be people that you want to associate with. But even worse than that is to deal with an envious man. And I'll tell you why. And I'll just give you the definition of the word and we'll see why. Envy in the noun form, is malignant or hostile feeling, ill will, malice, or enmity. Envy in the verb sense, like if you envy someone, is to feel displeasure at and ill will at the superiority of another person in happiness, success, reputation, or the possession of anything desirable to regard with discontent another's possession of some superior advantage which one would like to have for oneself. So you see by the definitions there how pride and envy go together so well. Because it, when, some, when you perceive that somebody else is superior to you, then you have ill will towards them, which is envy. And this is what's happening with Satan. He has ill will toward the man, toward God, and then toward the man. He wanted to be like the Most High. He tried to overthrow God from his throne, but he failed. Right? So that, that didn't work out. So when he, after having lost the first battle and being cast out of heaven, then he goes after man. Then he focuses on destroying man out of envy of man. I can see no other reason for it. Why else would he have done that? Now, there are two purposes for this, two purposes for going after the man. Number one, it's a way of getting at God. Because if God created man and you can destroy man, then you just destroyed God's creation and it'd be like if you spent you know, a year of your life building a house and then somebody goes and burns it down. Well, you've harmed the person that built the house, right, if you, if you destroy their creation. So this would be the first, the first thing that would come to mind is that he was just trying to harm God. But then secondly, this would allow Satan to become the prince of this world. You see, because man was given dominion over all of the earth, right, over the earth itself, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle of the field. And if Satan can destroy man, he has dominion over everything. He becomes the prince of this world. So two reasons there. It makes sense. It's logical to conclude why Satan would have gone after Adam and Eve. So God gave Adam a law prohibiting him to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And with that law, he attached to it a penalty. And the penalty was death. So we, we know this story well, but if we go back to Genesis 2 and verse 17, I'm going to read you the verse. I'd recommend memorizing this verse because basically this verse is core to pretty much our entire religion. Our entire religion is founded, I don't know if I'd say founded, but is definitely tied to this one little verse. It says there in Genesis 2 and verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There's a lot of people that follow Satan here in saying, thou shalt not surely die. Because a lot of people don't think that Adam and Eve actually died whenever they ate the fruit. They just think that they got sick or they, you know, they kind of 
they lost some of what they had, but they still had that little spark of divinity in them. You know, they still had that ability. If they really wanted to clean themselves up, they could do certain things and make God happy, and then God would give them eternal life in exchange for that. that that's basically what, what all the world's religions come down to. Man, is he's messed up. Yeah, he's not the greatest, but there's still enough good in him that if he wants to, and if he humbles himself, and if he chooses to, he can give himself eternal life, you know, with a little bit of God's help. I mean, that's how I would sum up most of the world's religions. But this verse says that when they ate, they would die, surely die. And we, of course, we know it's not physical death. It has to be spiritual death. They spiritually died. And when you're dead, you have no capacity and strength to do anything. And that right there is what separates what we believe from what the other 7 billion people in the world believe. Pretty much. It, it, it all comes down to that verse. I shouldn't say the other. I mean, we're not the only ones. There are a few out there. But the vast majority of people, in one form or another, in one religion or another, whether it's so-called Christianity or any of the other world religions, they all side together. That man isn't really actually dead, though they'll probably say he's dead because they don't want to be in conflict with the Bible. But what they mean by that is something quite different than actual death. Now, we know that Satan heard God give Adam this law because Satan later questions Eve about it. So Satan was apparently around. He, was, he heard God give him that. Genesis 3.1. Yea, hath God said, he said to the woman there, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Well, I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to give you some more information on that in a little bit. But just that, that fact right there proves that Satan was uh, within hearing distance whenever God gave Adam that law. So now Satan has a way that he can destroy Adam and Eve. He just needs to entice them to break God's commandment. Because, you see, Satan apparently... Uh, unlike a lot of liberal so-called Christians out there, Satan actually believed the word of God, right? <laughs> Think about it. Satan says, hey, God said he's going to kill them in the day they eat it of, eat of it. Well, all I got to do is get them to eat, and they're dead. You can think about that. Actually, that just came to mind. Satan believed the word of God. He believed that God was going to do what he said. I, I think some people should maybe take some lessons from Satan out there and actually believe that the Bible means what it says and that God will actually do what he says in it. So now Satan has a way that he can kill them. He's just got to somehow get them to eat that fruit and their toast. But how's he going to accomplish this? How's he going to kill Adam and Eve and get rid of them and then have the dominion of the earth? Murdering them outrightly probably wouldn't work. Because now I'm going to speculate, but I'm going to speculate that when Adam and Eve were perfect and sinless, that God was under their protection. And I don't think that's probably a far cry to uh, assume that. So just killing them, of course he's more powerful than them, but just killing them is not going to work because God's not going to allow that. Forcing them against their will to eat the fruit isn't going to work either. Right? If he jams it down their throat, that's not going to work because God's not going to consider that a breach of his law because they didn't willfully eat of the fruit, right? So that, that wouldn't work. Somehow Satan's got to figure out how he can make them want to break God's commandment, how he can make them choose to do it of their own will. This would have to be accomplished through deception, right? There's really no other way to do it. He somehow has to trick them into eating this fruit. Now, Satan apparently had observed the natures of the man and of the woman. And by doing that, apparently, he had figured out which one of them it would be easiest and best to tempt to sin and to deceive. Now, this doesn't require much speculation. I am speculating, but this doesn't really require a whole lot of speculation. Because we know that Satan was present when God gave Adam the commandment, right? We already know that because he quoted the commandment back to Eve. So he was around whenever he heard the commandment that was given to them. So therefore, it follows that he was present after Eve was created and he would have had the chance to observe them. So if he was around and, and paying attention whenever the commandment was given before Eve was created, then chances are he stuck around and he was paying attention and watching after Eve was created. So he's watching Adam and Eve, and I don't think that's a, a far stretch to assume. Now, since Satan is extremely intelligent, we read there in Ezekiel 28, 12, you don't have to go there, but we've looked at that before, where it said that Satan sealed up the sum, Lucifer sealed up the sum, he was perfect and full of wisdom. So he's very intelligent, and I've talked about that earlier in this series. 
So being extremely intelligent, he would have been able to understand what much less intelligent people like us have figured out. And that is that women are more emotionally driven and more easily deceived than men. Right? And that's not, I know that that's horribly politically incorrect to say that and feminists hate it, but that is the fact. And of course, the Bible teaches this as well. It says that Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. We'll get to that verse in a little bit. And it also tells us in 1 Peter 3 that the woman is the weaker vessel. And, and this is just a common observation. And, you know, like it or not, that's just the way it is. That doesn't mean that women are, are inferior. It just means that they're different, right? And they're just made up differently and they, they uh, think differently than men do. So Satan could have easily figured out that the man deeply loves his wife and can be influenced by her. Just a little bit of observing men and women, married couples together, would it be easy to conclude that the man, a man really loves his wife and that a man is, can be influenced by his wife quite easily. And I would say just as a note, men, love your wives enough to say no to them when you need to. Because sometimes women, wives will come up with something that they think their husband should do or the family should do, and it's not a good idea. And sometimes men, because they love their wives so much, want to just go along to get along and do whatever the wife says. And that's not a good idea if it's not the right thing to do. So love your wives enough to say no, just like you love your children enough to say no. Politically incorrect, yes, I know, but it's true. So therefore, the easiest way to bring down our first parents would be to first bring down Eve, who is easier to be deceived, and then through Eve, bring down Adam. And I've just kind of reasoned my way through this, and I don't think it's too much of a stretch. So Satan beguiled Eve using the following tactics. So I'll get to the tactics in just a second, but let me just show you from the scripture that he beguiled her, and then I'm going to define beguile for you. Genesis 3 and verse 13. In the interrogation, Eve correctly says that the serpent beguiled her. It says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And it was true. It's not an excuse. She can't use that to to get off the hook, but it was true. The serpent did beguile her. To beguile, beguile means to entangle or overreach with guile, to delude, deceive, or cheat. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, Paul reiterates and affirms this fact. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. It says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Just like Satan tricked Eve, Satan can trick us, and he can trick us into believing false doctrine. He can trick us into doing foolish things that will get us in trouble with God. And this is what Paul was concerned with. Paul was concerned that these people might actually believe another Jesus if another Jesus was presented to them, as he goes on to say in the the next verse. So Satan beguiled Eve using the following tactics. So first he takes the form of a serpent, which was the most subtle of all the beasts of the field. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Something about snakes. They, apparently they've always been, snu- been subtle. And if you just think about the nature of a snake, they slither around, they're really close to the ground, they're hard to see. If they're in grass, you can't hardly see them, right? They, and they blend in with their surroundings. There's just something about a snake that is tricky, crafty, and subtle. And it's probably no... Uh, coincidence that Satan chose to inhabit a snake to tempt our first parents. Genesis 3 and verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. I don't have subtle defined there, but it basically means to, to uh, similar to beguile, to, to trick and to be wily and, and uh, those kind of things. And to be extremely perceptive and wise. So then Satan begins the deception by questioning God's commandment. This is how it always works. You start off with a question. Sounds innocent enough. Just a simple little question. Yea, hath God said? He's basically saying, did God say that you couldn't eat of every tree of the garden? Genesis 3 and verse 1, right there in the middle of the verse. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. 
Just a little question, yay or yes? In other words, did God actually say that you couldn't eat of every tree of the garden? You see, if you just came right out, if he just said to her, hey, you can go ahead and eat that tree, and she'd be like, well, no, God said I can't, right? So you don't start out just outright denying what God said. You start off with a question, and this is how people do it. They start questioning. Satan was the first Bible skeptic and critic. You realize that? Because what he was doing is what people have been doing now for hundreds and thousands of years, especially a lot in the last 150. They've been questioning and criticizing God's word. I've had people condemn me for, I am not much of a textual critic. You're darn right I'm not a textual critic. I don't criticize the text of the word of God. I just believe it. This is what the modern Bibles do, though. They've been doing this for especially since 1881 when Westcott and Hort translated, or when they, not when they translated, but whenever they made the Greek New Testament from a bunch of garbage manuscripts. And when I say garbage manuscripts, I literally mean, one in particular, a piece of garbage manuscript because it was found in a garbage can in, a, in Mount Catherine's monastery on Mount Sinai. It literally was found in a garbage can by Tischendorf. And that's not, I'm not even making that up. This is what they, this is what these modern Bibles do. And this is what Westcott and Hort did. What they were, were imposters of Satan, basically. Not imposters, but they were, they were uh, pawns of Satan saying, Yea, hath God said. And every time you open up an NIV or a New King James or any of these modern versions, and you look in the footnote and it says, the earliest and best manuscripts say thus and so, or the earliest and best manuscripts do not include these words or this verse. You know what that is? That is Satan saying, yea, hath God said? Did God really say those words? Or were those inserted later? Should they really not even be there? That's how Satan deceives, with a question. This type of questioning has the effect of making the other person begin to doubt what God says. Because sometimes, you know, you're going along your merry way and you've believed something for a long time and then somebody questions it and then you think, oh, well, I never really have given that a second thought. Well, it could be that maybe it does need question, but it could be that it's just truth and when you start giving it a second thought and you have that doubt of, or that seed of doubt planted in your mind, then you can go and run with that if you're not careful and if you're not um, biblically wise. Rather than rebuking the skeptic, Eve plays right into his hand by answering him. You see, what she should have done is rebuked him. You don't want to answer a fool according to his folly, lest they'll be like unto him. And that's basically what Eve was doing. She answered the question. She fell for the trap. Instead of just rebuking him and saying, get thee behind me, Satan. No, she, she kind of goes along with it. Maybe she thinks that she's a match for Satan. Either because of ignorance or confusion or forgetfulness or just being flustered by a talking snake, which, you know, that, admittedly, that could be. Eve attempts to paraphrase God's commandments, but she ends up adding to it and watering it down. Now, she's trying to do a good job, but you know what? She wasn't a very good Bible student. She did not have the word hidden in her heart, did she? She didn't know exactly what it said. She had a rough idea of what it said, but then when she quotes it, she kind of gets it garbled up, and, and she really ended up adding to it and, and correcting it a bit. You see how this happens? And you can see this pattern right here is something that we all ought to be well aware of because this is how Satan does it, and he does the same thing with us. Right? There's no difference between us and Eve. Same thing happens to us. She says that God said that they weren't allowed to even touch the fruit. But that wasn't right, was it? Let's go ahead and read in verses 2 through 3. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Okay, she's good so far. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said... Now, when you say God said, you better be right. right? You, if you say, Thus saith the Lord, you better be right. You better have the verse right. But she didn't. God hath said, you shall not eat of it, that's good, neither shall you touch it. Where did God ever say that? God never said, neither shall you touch it. She added that. Now, maybe she wanted to make it more forceful. Maybe she's going to just add to it a little bit because she thinks it's going to make it a little better. All right? God said, don't eat it. He even said, don't touch it. All right? So maybe she's just trying to, trying to, to um, come up with a better argument than just actually quoting what the verse says. 
But that's not a good idea. You know what? Just go with what God says. Don't try to come up with something above and beyond what God says because you think it might be better because this didn't work out for Eve. You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And there she blows it again. Lest ye die. Did God say in verse 217, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, you might die or, you know, that don't eat it because to prevent yourself from dying. But he said, thou shalt surely die. But she says, he says, don't eat it or touch it lest you die. Now, lest doesn't exactly, it, it doesn't carry with it uh, is, is bad of a connotation as I used to think. But it doesn't carry with it as strong, as, not nearly as strong of a statement as what God made. And I will define that word here for you in just a second. So she said they're not allowed to touch it. And that's actually an addition to the commandment. It was incorrect because he commanded them to dress and keep the trees of the garden, right? So we know that he didn't tell them not to touch it because that would have contradicted his other commandment. In verse 15 of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, of course, we know that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the garden. And if he put man in the garden to dress and to keep it, that means that he was to dress and to keep the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he would have touched it. Nothing wrong with touching it. You just don't eat it. But Eve had kind of added that one in for some reason. Now, she quotes God as saying, lest you die. Lest is defined as, it's used as a negative participle of intention or purpose, introducing a clause expressive of something to be prevented or guarded against. So she's saying that God said, don't eat it to prevent or guard against you dying. Okay, I mean, yeah, that's, that's true, but it does not carry the force of thou shalt surely die, right? It doesn't carry the same force. It's kind of like using a modern Bible version, which maybe kind of, sort of says the same thing, but it just doesn't have the force of the King James. It doesn't have the force of the Word of God. Or it'd be like quoting a, a book on psychology or something to kind of get at the same thing the Proverbs are saying, but it just doesn't have the force of what the Proverbs say, right? So go with the Word of God. Don't go with some alternate rendering of it that just doesn't have the teeth that the Word of God did. Because if she would have said to Satan, thou shalt not eat thereof, and the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You see, then maybe the outcome would have been different, right? But she didn't say that. She, she really dropped her cookies there. It is true that not eating the fruit of the tree would prevent her guard against them dying, but her paraphrase did not express the full truth of what God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You know what Eve was? She was the first Bible reviser, right? Satan was the first critic of the Bible, but Eve was the first Bible reviser, she just changed it up a little bit. You know, that old language that was like a week old, you know, that was, that was, it was kind of hard to understand, right? Things have changed. She was just trying to update with the times, right? And, you know, thou shalt surely die. What does that really mean? I mean, these words are kind of complicated. I'll just make it a little easier to understand, right? She's the first Bible reviser. But now she's in a very vulnerable position. You see, she has just tried to defend God's truth with kind of just paraphrasing at it, and she's kind of and she's already misquoted it, and she says, I can't touch it, but that's not really true. She says, lest you die, and it doesn't really have the force of it. So think about it in her own mind, right? She has just said that God said, you shall not touch it, lest you die to prevent or guard against you dying. Now in her mind, she doesn't have the force of thou shalt surely die. If she would have had in her mind and she remembered that what God actually said, thou shalt surely die, she might not have fallen for the deception. But in her mind, she's got lest she die. Doesn't sound quite as good, does it? She doesn't have a clear understanding of the word of God and therefore she will not be able to discern truth from error regarding God's commandment. That's the problem. She didn't know her Bible well enough. And now she's going to get taken whenever Satan comes in with the outright denying the Word of God. So he moves from questioning the Word of God to outright contradicting the Word of God now. He starts with a question, and then he finds that he has an unstable soul that he's dealing with. He finds that he's got a woman that doesn't really know her Bible very well, and now he moves in for the kill, and he just outright denies what it says. Genesis 3 and, chapter, er, Genesis 3 and verse 4. 
And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. 180 degrees opposite of what God said. God said, Thou shalt surely die. He says, Ye shall not surely die. Now, if this would have been the first thing that he said, it probably wouldn't have worked out well because Eve would have recognized, boy, that's 180 degrees different than what God said. But he's questioned it. He's caused her to question it. And now she, she misquotes it and she gets her mind all garbled up. And now he goes in for the kill. Now, no, notice what else he does. Without even giving her a time to respond, then he accuses God of having ulterior motives for giving the commandment, telling her that God was really just trying to prevent them from becoming gods and knowing good and evil. Verse 5. Notice that in, the con- that in the conversation here, Satan starts out with a question and then he lets her respond. She responds and then he makes his next statement. Thou shalt not surely die. But he doesn't give her time to say, well, but, but didn't God say something about surely dying? He doesn't give her that time. He jumps right in with the next thing. Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he denies what God says, and then he comes in, and he, he tries to show that God actually has ulterior motives. God is not doing this for your best interest. God has some other reason for doing it. And he tries to get her interested in, hmm, why might God have actually said what he said? You know, I've dealt with this before. I've told you about people that I've dealt with where they, you know, you give them a a verse, you know, flee fornication, for instance, and they say, well, you know, I've always wondered why God said that we should, we should not, you know, fornicate before we're married. I've always wondered why that could be. Could it be for the, the family problems it causes or for the social problems it causes or, you know, maybe preventing STDs and da, 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 and all these reasons and all this stuff. It doesn't matter why he said it. He said it. So you do what he says, and then if you want to prognosticate about why he might have said it, we'll go ahead and do that. But you've got to do what he said. So now this leaves it open to, to Eve, and she thinks, oh, well, why might God have said that? And maybe if I know the real reasons why God would have said that, maybe then it doesn't actually mean that I can't eat the fruit. You know, you just start to, get to, just start to question things. You see, Satan's tempting a sinless woman who had limited knowledge and didn't know evil, right? So she's, this is tempting to her because to have the knowledge of good and evil and to be as gods is something that she doesn't have right now. And boy, doesn't that sound good? To be as gods, to, to know what God knows, to know good and evil, right? This, is, this would be enticing. This piques her curiosity. Now Satan's work is nearly complete. He has planted the seeds of deception now, and now Eve just runs with it, right? Satan's work is done. He's questioned, and then he's contradicted, and then he's given an ulterior uh, motive that God has. He's given an an alternate uh, explanation, and now Eve just, she just runs with it. She stops thinking about God's straightforward commandment, and she starts reasoning within herself. Verse 6, Genesis 3, 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. So she goes from arguing with Satan and trying to resist Satan, but not having a real good grasp on the scripture. And now he's deceived her to the point where she starts looking. She's like, well, it does kind of look good. I mean, the tree is good for food, right? Doesn't that appeal to the lust of the flesh? Turn with me to 1 John 2 and verse 16. I'm going to show you that all of the elements of the world were present right back there in the Garden of Eden. 1 John 2 and verse 16. 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I'm going to show you that all three of these things are present right there, what John talked about. The tree is good for food, the lust of the flesh. Well, it looks to me, it's, it looks like it's good tasty fruit? Why not? I mean, what could be so bad about that? I want to be healthy after all. It was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. Well, it certainly looks nice, right? It's a nice big red apple, right? No, it wasn't a red apple. Remember, that's what everybody, that's what everybody portrays it being, but we don't know that it was a red apple at all. It was a fruit of some kind. It was desired to make one wise. That's the pride of life, right? Then that appeals to her pride. She's like, boy, it'd be nice to be wise. It'd be nice to know things that I don't know now because there's all kinds of things that that she's unaware of at this point. Just imagine 
the, the things that she doesn't know because her and Adam, Adam are, are brand new on the earth and all of the information to learn has not yet been learned. Intelligent, yes, but full of knowledge, probably not. They haven't been around for only maybe a few days or a short period of time. So boy, to know all the stuff that God knows, that's enticing. So she's been deceived. That's what Paul tells us. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 14. She has now been deceived. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 14. It says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, this is just a side note. I think I have this somewhere else. I do. Okay, never mind. I'll get to that in just a second. I wanted to make sure I didn't forget about it. So she's been deceived. Deceived means deluded, imposed upon, misled, mistaken. To deceive means to ensnare, to take unawares by craft or guile. Right? That's what it is to be subtle. That's what Satan did. To overcome, overreach, to get the better of by trickery, to beguile, to beguile or betray into mischief or sin, to mislead. So she's been tricked ensnared, right? He questions, he contradicts, he gives an alternate explanation, and she starts looking at it and says, it doesn't look all that bad, and she kind of forgets about what God actually said about the dying thing, and she goes for it. She took of the fruit and ate thereof, Genesis 3, 6. Now, though Eve was deceived, she's still guilty of sin, because I, I think, I don't know if this has ever crossed your mind, but I remember thinking this a while back when it says that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, for that death passed upon all men, Romans 5 and verse 12. And I used to wonder, well, did Eve actually sin? or was at, Because it says by one man sin entered into the world. Was, was Adam the only one that sinned and Eve didn't sin? No, Eve did sin. But Eve did not pass her sinful nature down to all of her children. The sinful nature is passed down through the man. That's why Jesus Christ could be born of a woman, right? Born of Mary, natural. He, he got Mary's DNA just like any other baby, but he would, did not have a human father, so the, so the Joseph's sinful nature did not get passed down to Jesus because Joseph wasn't his father. God was his father, and that's why he didn't have a, a sinful nature. So Eve was in the transgression, it says there. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So she sinned. It just was that her sin didn't pass down to the rest of her children. Adam's did. This is why Satan really had to get at Adam. Right? Just to bring Eve down wouldn't have been enough because God could have just made another woman. He could have just taken another rib from Adam and made another one for him. It wasn't enough just to get Eve. He had to get Adam. But in order to get Adam, he had to go through Eve because he had figured out, you know what, Eve is a much easier target because of how God has made her. She's more easily tricked. Look at uh, first, let me just show you. It says there that the woman being deceived was in the transgression. You don't have to turn there, but 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. So if she's in the transgression, that means she committed sin. So now Eve has eaten the fruit, and she is now spiritually dead while she liveth. It kind of reminds me of that passage there in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It says that she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Well, guess what? Eve was trying to live in pleasure. It's pleasant to the eyes, desire to make one wise. It's good for food. She's going to live in pleasure. She is dead while she liveth. She is spiritually dead. She was drawn away of her own lust and enticed. Look at James 1 and verse 14. This is how all sin works. This is how it always happens. James 1 and verse 14. It's not that God tempts you. James says, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. James 1, 14. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desire to make one wise. She was tempted, drawn away of her own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. She's in the transgression. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. She died spiritually that day, and when sin was finished, she died. Well, we know Adam died 930 years later. It doesn't say how old Eve was when she died, but she did. Sin finished, and she was toast. Now, 
Now, Satan's only one step away from killing Adam. So he's got Eve, and now Eve can do the rest to get Adam. See, once Satan has gotten a follower, then the follower can do his bidding. So Eve hands the fruit to Adam. Genesis 3 and verse 6. Genesis 3 and verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. She gives it to him and he takes a bite too. Now, I don't know. I think there are different opinions on this, whether Adam was present whenever Satan was talking to Eve or whether he was absent. I would tend to think that he was not there. If you're Satan, are you going to walk up to a woman when she's with her husband and try to deceive her? Of course not, right? If you're, a, if you're a, some shyster salesman, are you going to come to the door at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock at night when the husband's home? Of course not. You're going to find an old lady, right, that, that doesn't quite have her, her mental abilities like she used to, and she's really easily, she doesn't quite understand, easy to be deceived. And you're going to come there and you're going to try to, to you know, hornswoggle her. You're not going to... You're going to be there when the husband's there. So I highly doubt that Adam was there. Whether he was or not, it doesn't really matter. But I tend to think he was not there. If he was there, what a lousy husband was he? But at this time he was sinless, so it'd be hard to say that a sinless guy was a lousy husband. But any guy that would stand by and allow his wife to be deceived wouldn't be much of a husband, would he? So she tells him to take a bite. Now we know that she told him to eat because he listened to her. Right, in Genesis 3, 6, it just says she gave unto her husband. But we know that she actually told him to eat it because, in verse 17, it says that he had hearkened unto her or listened to her. Genesis three seventeen, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. He hearkened. He listened. He obeyed his wife. Not a good idea. Good idea to listen to your wife and hear what she has to say and consider it, but not a good idea to obey your wife when she tells you to do something that God said not to do. Never want to go there. Now, whether or not Adam heard the conversation between Eve and Satan is immaterial because either way, Adam was not deceived. One thing is for sure. If Adam was standing there, which I doubt that he was, but if he was, it wasn't like Adam's thinking, oh boy, it's, you know, desirous to make me wise. It sure looks good for food. It's pleasant to the eyes. All that stuff. Adam was not deceived. Adam was not thinking, oh, I wonder if God really said that I'll die. Adam was not deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing whenever he did it. Remember 1 Timothy 2.14, the man was not deceived but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So Adam knew what he was doing. Whether he heard what Satan said or not, it doesn't matter. Now, how do we show God that we love him? It's by keeping his commandments, right? John 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's how we show God that we love him. And it says there in 1 John 5 and verse 3, that by this we know that we love God, if we fear God and keep his commandments. 1 John 5 and verse 3. That was a different verse I was quoting at, but it says, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. I was thinking of, uh, of uh, verse 2. But so the love of God is keeping His commandments. Adam obeyed his wife, though. It says, Thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife in Genesis 3.17. Therefore, Adam loved his wife more than God. I've heard people say this for a long time, that Adam's sin was that he loved his wife more than God, and I just never bought into that for the longest time because I could kind of see reasoning to get it, but I just thought, I don't know if I can just reason my way into that. I I can't prove it. But with Genesis 3.17, when it says that he has hearkened unto the voice of his wife, Right? He obeyed the voice of his wife. And when God says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and Adam kept what Eve's commandment instead of God's commandment, what does that mean? He loved Eve more than he loved God. And now I do. I do believe what the preachers say now. because I And I didn't come up with that on my own. It was just I always heard the speculation. And then one day I actually heard it preached about Genesis 3.17. And the light bulb went on. 
and and they're right. So what ca- what Satan could not accomplish through deception, he accomplished through the power of ungodly love. Think about that. What Adam could not accomplish through deception, because Adam was not deceived. What Satan could not accomplish through deception, he accomplished through the power of ungodly love. And I say ungodly love because he loved his wife more than God, right? That's ungodly love. You can love your wife too much, or you can love your husband too much. If you choose them over God, or over his church, or over what his word says, you love them too much. And truth be told, it's weird, but you don't actually love them, right? In a sense, you love them too much, but in fact, you don't really love them, because if you love them, if you love the children of God, you'll fear God and keep his commandments, right? You'll love God and keep his commandments. Kind of a strange thing, but it makes sense if you think about it. So Adam ate the fruit. Eve gave to her husband and he did eat, Genesis 3, 6. Adam instantly died spiritually. Remember what God said, Genesis 2, 17, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And we're told in Romans 5 and verse 12, that for, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, for that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam died that day. Adam and Eve, and here, here's how we can know that he died spiritually that day, because we see a spiritual change in them. Turn back to Genesis chapter 3 again. Genesis chapter 3, 8 through 10. Let's see the change in Adam and Eve. Genesis 3. They went from being in, or they went from being sinless and innocent to being ashamed. Genesis 3, 6, 7. And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They're ashamed. They were naked up until this point and had no shame. There's no no problem with that. Now all of a sudden they know that they're naked, and they feel feel uncomfortable, and they feel ashamed, so they sew fig leaves together, and they make themselves aprons. It's interesting. There's a false religion out there called Freemasonry that their adherents wear aprons to cover their front parts there. It's interesting that when man sins... One of the things that is, uh, happens right after he sins is that he makes himself an apron. And then you've got this false religion of masonry that what, one of the main things of their religion is the apron with the compass and square on it. I think that's curious. Adam and Eve went from being in communion with God to hiding from him. Verses 8 through 10. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam... And his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? You see, they were in communion with God up until now, but now they're afraid of him. They're running from him. They're hiding from him. You see, there's been a change to their spiritual nature. They're not like they used to be anymore. Adam went from being in perfect harmony with his wife to blaming her for his sin. I'm sure that went over well that night. Genesis 3, 11 and 12. Let's just get verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, and this is God speaking, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. You see, he goes from having a wonderful marriage with probably the most, well, I mean, not probably, with the most beautiful woman in the world. How do I know she was the most beautiful woman in the world? Because she was the only woman in the world, right? She was, and she was probably a very beautiful woman. She was perfect and very good and all that. So he goes from having a wonderful marriage to now blaming her for his sin. This, this whole chapter, I mean, this part of the chapter here is the blame game. He goes after Adam, why'd you do that? Oh, it's this woman that thou gavest me. You know who he's really blaming? God. It's this woman that you gave me. If you would have never gave me the woman, I would have never sinned. Right? It's her fault. And actually, it's your fault. Then he goes to her, and he wants to know what happened. And she says, it was that dang snake over there. The snake beguiled me. And then he goes to the serpent. He doesn't even bother asking him. He just curses him. 11, and did I read verse 12? I did, I read verse 12. And then Eve went from being sinless to not accepting responsibility for her choices. Verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. 
You see, she's not fessing up. She's not accepting the responsibility for her actions. Now she's blaming the snake, blaming Satan. And boy, this is as old as humanity. The devil made me do it. You ever, you ever you know, heard somebody say that? It was the devil. I was just tempted. I couldn't handle it. That's not true. I mean, the devil tempts you. But the fact that you couldn't handle it, you had to give in, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, and he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So the old, the, old, the devil made me do it excuse doesn't uh, buy you many points with God. Eve was cursed with sorrowful childbearing, and lots of it. Verse 16, Genesis 3, 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So Eve's curse is for her, her sorrow and her conception to be multiplied. So her childbirth would be more painful and there would be more of it. If your conception's multiplied, your pregnancies are multiplied, you're going to have more kids. So you have painful pregnancy and you have a lot more of it because she's going to be popping out kids left and right. That's her punishment, to have a bunch of kids and to have a bunch of sorrow with that. Adam was cursed to hard labor where he would have to work in a cursed earth that brought forth thorns and thistles, verses 17 through 19. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Just think about what, how stupid and remorseful Adam and Eve must have felt like, even if they weren't remorseful for their sin, which it doesn't really sound like they were, but just imagine how remorseful they would be to what they had lost. Because here they live in a perfect garden, they live in paradise, and now all of a sudden she's going to have painful childbearing, he's going to be working with thorns and thistles and sweat of his brow. You just think all that they lost. And you know, Satan was cursed to crawl in his belly, or the, the serpent was cursed to crawl in his belly, and Satan was cursed by God for that. But you know what? I'll bet you with that curse was kind of like, yeah, I got him. You know, yeah, I'm cursed, but I got them. They're cursed. Misery loves company. So in this case, and then, then Satan, uh, then Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden. I mean, I didn't want to miss that point. 22 through 24. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take hold of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him from, forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence it was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I wish I could preach on what the tree of life was and how that they could have eaten it and lived forever and all that. But I'll be completely honest with you. I don't know. I just, I don't know what to make of that and how it would be that they would have lived forever if they'd eaten the tree of life. And maybe someday I will know, but I, I don't know right now. So I'm just going to leave that one alone. But they were driven out of the garden at, at the very least, just on a very elementary level they were in a garden. You know, you've been to a garden before, right? Everything's planted and it was apparently like an orchard because there's trees in there and it's just a nice place to work. Well, imagine being thrown from the garden out into the forest where you got to clear all the trees and plow it up and, you know, it'd be a lot harder for them. At the very least, they were cursed. So Satan had won the battle of destroying Adam and Eve, but God had outsmarted him. You see, Satan thought that he had this one won. Now, I've destroyed man, and I've got dominion over all the earth. And it seems like, I'm sure to him, this is great. I finally won. You know what? Yeah, I'm not in heaven anymore. But hey, I've killed Adam and Eve, and I've got the whole earth and all the dominion of it to myself. 
But it didn't quite work out for him. First of all, God cursed the serpent, which Satan had co-opted to deceive Eve, and he's going to spend the rest of his life crawling on his belly and eating dust. Genesis 3 and verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed art, or thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and shalt and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And you think about it. It certainly seems to me that the serpent was cursed. I don't know if he had legs before that. It kind of seems like it because he was cursed to crawl on his belly. He probably had legs and then he, his legs were taken away. But just think about the curse of the serpent. I mean, there are some crazy people out there that actually like snakes and, you know, like to handle them or whatever. But, you know, and if that's your thing, that's fine. But that's not my thing. But I'll tell you what, most people, it appears at least in Western civilization, are afraid of snakes for the most part. The, you know, the people down in South America, the indigenous peoples down there, they worship snakes. But you know what? Who were they worshiping? The devil, right? Of course they like snakes because they were devil worshipers. But for a lot of us, snakes are just creepy and they're scary. And I think that was part of the curse upon the serpent. So he's cursed. And, but then God makes a promise to Eve that her seed, which would be her male descendant, that he would wound Satan's heel and that... But that, or I'm sorry, that, um, no, no. Satan would wound his heel, but then the woman's seed would crush his head in Genesis 3.15. And this is where Satan did not see what was coming. Kind of like whenever he engineered the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and thought that he had won the battle again. And we'll get to that in a long time from now. And what he didn't realize is that was his undoing. Well, guess what? He should have learned the first time. When he brought down the first Adam, it was his undoing. When he brought down the second Adam, it was his ultimate undoing. Verse 15, Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the woman is going to have a seed, a male descendant, and there's going to be enmity between Satan and the woman's seed. And Satan is going to bruise his heel, kind of like a serpent would snap at his heel. But the woman's seed, is going to bruise his head. You see, when you get your heel bruised, it hurts, but it's not so much a big deal. When you get your head crushed or your head bruised, that's a fatal wound. This is the, this is the most ancient prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. He was born of a woman, Mary, who was born of a whole bunch of women going the whole way back to Eve. So Jesus Christ is Eve's descendant, and her, he is her seed. And he is the seed that would bruise the head of the serpent. We'll get to that in a long time from now. So Satan now knows that there is coming a man that will be born of a woman who will destroy him. Remember, he believes the Bible. He knows what's coming. He believes what God said. He doesn't like it, and he, I think sometimes he has cognitive dissonance because He'll see what God says. He knows what his end is going to be. And if, if you think if he was smart, he'd just wave the white flag and just surrender and ask for mercy. But he knows what's coming, but he, I guess he knows he can't change it and he's going to fight till the end. At this point, any child that is born into the world who's a child of God is the potential destroyer of Satan. Remember, he said it's her seed. Now, for all Satan knows, it's going to be one of her actual children that she births, right? So it could be Abel. It could be any of the other male children that she had. That's just kind of a spoiler alert. It could be Abel, right? The woman's seed is going to bruise his head, and then she has a seed. And what does Satan do? It kills him. But that's going to come next Sunday. Satan now sets out to destroy the woman's seed before he destroys him. Because he believes it's going to happen, but he thinks, well, maybe, maybe, just maybe, I can still, you know, win this battle. So the rest of this series is going to be just like this. He takes his aim at the seed of the woman right down throughout history, trying to prevent the Messiah from coming to bruise his head. And it's going to be interesting, I think.